Can everyone give me a little shout? Your best shout. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> All right. If you at the club, let me hear how you're gonna shout at the club. Oh no. Uh, no, no, no. Someone's getting more excited at the club for a charger game than we do when we come to worship God. Anyways, we are starting a brand new series called Irresistible. Look to your neighbor and say, Irresistible. Irresistible. Look to your other neighbor that you didn't want to turn to and say, Irresistible. And say irresistible. And, and look at your neighbor and do one of these. Ready? Look them up and down and go. You're looking pretty irresistible. Uh, uh, uh. So, Kim and I, uh, Kim is sick, pray for her, man, everyone's sick today. Kim is sick, but she and I have been talking, and she came to me a few months ago, she said, Josh, uh, what's going to be our, our theme word for the year? Like, what are you talking about? She goes, yeah, some churches, they have like a word, and that's their, their theme word for the year, and they kind of bring it up throughout the year. I said, I don't know, let's pray on it, let's think about it. So we spent a few weeks just praying, we spent a few weeks thinking on it, just listening, and all of a sudden, it hit us. Irresistible. Irresistible. What is that? And I started thinking, God is irresistible. I don't know if you've ever tasted or seen God, but when you taste, when you see a little taste of God, God has this magnetic, compelling force. He's so full of love and peace and joy and kindness. And God is actually pretty cool, you guys. Amen? Yes, amen. So we started thinking about irresistible. Then we started thinking about irresistible moments. Have you ever had an irresistible moment in your life? Huh? Yeah, everybody has. Everybody has. I hope so. Well, I want to take you back. In the sixth grade, I dated this girl, Melinda Fajardo. <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember Melinda Fajardo family, but she was my sixth grade high school uh, elementary sweetheart. Uh, she's on the right here, she's older now, but in the sixth grade, Melinda Fajardo was it, all right? In, in sixth grade, Eastlake Elementary, every boy wanted Melinda. They, she was, she was just fine, you know? Just like, yeah, you know? She had it going on. And, and what was amazing about her was she was quiet, you know? She didn't flaunt, she was, no, she was just a little bit, this quiet little shy girl, and every boy wanted to be Melinda's boyfriend. Especially. And guess who got to be her boyfriend? <laughs> Come on, guess! It was you! Me! <laughs> I got to be her boyfriend in the sixth grade, and Melinda was irresistible. And, uh, and so we dated in the sixth grade, if that even counts. And in the seventh grade, we broke up because she went to Bonita Middle High School and I went to Rancho Del Rey Middle. I mean, Bonita Middle School and, and I went to Rancho, Rancho Del Rey. So we, we broke up and that was, that was the end of it. But then eighth grade, the rumor was coming around that Melinda was coming to Rancho Del Rey. Mm -hmm. You know how they start talking? And everyone started asking, Josh, are you going to get back with Melinda? And I was like, That's, that was so last year. Her and I are done, you know. And she came to Rancho Del Rey Middle, and guess what happened? She's irresistible. She's irresistible. <laughs> and I just had to have her, so she became my girlfriend once again. And uh, I was crazy boyfriend, like crazy jealous boyfriends. Do you guys know any crazy jealous people? Yes. Uh, so uh, I was so crazy. Watch this. One time I was in, 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 in history class, and there was two guys in the class, Mike Miggles and Alejandro, Alejandro Ferria. Seriously, did you, did you know those guys? All right. So those guys were in history class, and they were flirting, according to me, with Melinda. <laughs> Right? I saw them laughing with her, and one, one of them even like touched her leg, and I was like, Ooh. <laughs> the Hulk, I was coming to the Hulk in that moment. So after class, I, I said, you two, bathroom now. <laughs> and they looked at me like I was crazy, like, what are you talking about? I was like, you've been flirting with my girl, it's done, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight both of you guys right now. <laughs> they didn't want none of it. So. Uh, so that was that, and, and then uh, nothing happened. But from that point on forward, they, they didn't want to look at Melinda. And that's exactly how I wanted it, all right? <laughs> so Melinda was this irresistible woman uh, in my life for a, a little bit. And, uh, and then, you know, for some of you, it wasn't Melinda. For some of you, it's California burritos. <laughs> huh? How many of you guys like California burritos from, uh, what's that place called? 
Lolitas, all right? For some of you guys, it might be the California burrito or the donuts or the extraordinary desserts, whatever it is, but all of us have experienced that thing that's just irresistible. Like you and I cannot resist that one thing. All of us have it. Whether it's a person, whether it's a thing, whether it's a moment, whether it's a place, whatever it might be, all of us have this thing that is irresistible to us that is pulling us. Some of us, it's BMWs. <laughs> Uncle, can I have one of your BMWs, please? He said no, it was quiet in the church. All right. <laughs> so here's where I want to go. I want to go to Psalms chapter 27. Looking at verse 4, this is what David says about this God that he got to encounter, this God that he got to experience. And I want us to get to this, this point in our lives where we get to experience this God who is irresistible. All right? So here's 27 verse 4. It says, one thing have I asked of the Lord. So the one thing that David says, wouldn't it be awesome if you, if you only had one thing to ask God? How many of you guys have a wish list? For God. But it's not one thing. Huh? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's not one thing. Usually we have a big list. God, would you give me a new house, a new car, uh, it's 2019, I, I want a new girlfriend or a new boyfriend. Whatever it is, we have this list. David says, I have one thing that I want from God, and this one thing that I will seek after with all my heart, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. How many days? Oh. He's got, I want one thing. I want to dwell in your house, God, all the days of my life, more than anything else, more than money, more than gold, more than women, more than power, more than fame, more than my kingship. God, there's one thing that I want. I want to dwell in your house all the days of my life. For what reason? That I may gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Have you ever thought that God was beautiful? Has that ever been an adjective? Has that ever been an adjective in a way that you describe who God is? David says, I want one thing. I just want to be in God's presence all the day of my life. Why? Because I just want to gaze at his beauty. Have you ever been mesmerized by a woman or a man physically? Yes. Are you alive out there? <laughs> Do you have emotions? Have you ever been mesmerized by someone that just walked by them and just caught your attention and you just couldn't for whatever reason? It's like this person was a magnet. You were just gravitating. You just want to look at them. You just gaze at their beauty. Maybe you don't even like them, but you were just appreciating what they looked like. Have you ever been there? Yes. Yes? Yeah, yeah. For some of us, it's Justin Bieber, right? <laughs> I know. Justin Bieber. Like, I just gazed upon his beauty. Right? <laughs> For others of us, give me somebody, uh, who's a lady that, that, that guys like a lot? J-Lo. J-Lo. For some of us, it's J-Lo. Just gaze upon her beauty. But David says, no, no, I found something better than J-Lo, something better than Justin Bieber. I have found this God, the creator of the universe, who is so deep, who is so amazing, who is so attentive to who I am, who's so full of love. I want to gaze upon God. Question. Do you want to gaze upon the beauty of God? Yes. The beauty of God. And, and what I love about this is this is not an obligation. Like, well, I kind of have to. No, no. I want to be there. Because I want to gaze upon the beauty of God. And I think for so many of us, the beauty that we look at sometimes, not all the times, it's, it's fool's gold beauty. It's plastic. It's material. We think, oh, you know, that's why, that's why Coca-Cola and these big companies spend billions of dollars, millions of dollars on marketing. Why? Because they're trying to get us just to buy. Like, guys, the iPhone. Every year we know it's going to come out with a new one, yeah? Yes. And they, they trick us all the time. You got to get the new iPhone. You got to get the new iPhone. This is, you got to get the new, the new, the next, the next, the better, the better. And all the while, God is saying, I have something way better. All right? Now, are you with me? Yes. yes. All right. We're going to go to another person's experience. This guy named Jeremiah, he is found in the Torah, the Old Testament. And he was a prophet 
of, of Israel. And here's what he said. And I've been here before, so I want to share this with you. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. He said, even if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak his name, his word burns in my heart like fire. It's like a fire in my bones. I am worn out of trying to hold it in. I can't do it. I have a confession to make to you guys. For about a year, year and a half, I told God I'm done with you. Done with you. I'm done praying. I'm done talking. I don't want nothing to do with you anymore. I had a lot of questions. You ever had a lot of questions? Mm -hmm. You ever said, God, when I get to heaven... You're going you're gonna to have to answer some things for me. Because there are some things that I just don't agree with, and I'm not cool with any of that stuff. And so I was wrestling for about a year, year and a half, and I was struggling in my faith. I got to the point where I actually didn't even want, I didn't talk to God literally for at least a year. Mercy. Done! Not talking to you, God. But guess what happened? He didn't stop talking to you. Jeremiah. <laughs> even if I try to say I'm never going to talk about you, man, even if I tell you I'm done with you, there was something deep down in my heart, in my bones, that I just couldn't resist. Because God is irresistible. Even when I said, I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't want it, God was gently calling me, whispering, Amen. loving, showing me affection and kindness. And even though I gave up on God, God never gave up on me. And even though I walked away, I wanted to, God just kept on. I stand at the door and I, no, if anybody hears my voice, I'll come in and I'll suck with them. I gave up on God, but no matter how hard I tried to give up, something kept pulling me back, pulling me back, pulling me back. Why? Because I had tasted, I had seen that the Lord is here. I've had, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest love affair ever. And that's with God. And once you taste that, nothing compares to anything. And maybe you're saying, what are you talking about, Josh? This is crazy talk. I dare you to pray a oh, simple prayer. God, give me a love affair with you. I dare you to say, God, give me a love affair with you. I want to experience something so deep and so profound. I want to have something better. It's like this hole inside of me. And I keep trying to fill it with things. But like a, like, like a cup that just has a hole at the bottom. Every time I feel it, it just keeps getting empty. And I feel it and just keeps getting empty. And God's saying, I want to fill your life with stuff that doesn't make you feel empty. I want to fill your life with something that's meaningful, profound, purposeful. I want to fill your life with more. Well, Josh, if you say God is so irresistible, then how can so many people resist God? If God is so irresistible, then how come the church is dying in the United States? Did you guys know the church that that the Christian church is actually dying in the United States? A lot. Did you know that? Every year the church is shrinking in the United States. You know that in, in Europe it's pretty much dead as well? Did you know this? Yeah, yeah. It's dying! If God is so irresistible, then how come people aren't coming through that door and saying, we want to experience this irresistible God that you talk about? Selfishness. Huh. God is so irresistible. How come clubs are more packed? Hmm? God, so do you guys want to know? Yes. How do you guys care? How do you don't care? Well, let's. I want to jump to this. Ready? Right? Here's what you guys know. This guy, right? Oh, yeah. Now he's irresistible. I used to look like Brad Pitt at one time my in my dreams. So here's what Brad Pitt says. He says, I got up, I got I was brought up being told that things were God's way. And when things didn't work out, it was called God's plan. I always had a lot of questions about the world. 
a big question to me was fairness. I wonder about, is God really fair? If I'd grown up in some other religion, would I get the same shot at heaven as a Christian has? Brad Pitt brought up Christian. And one of the things that he thought was, well, I want to know about, is God really fair? Because let's just say I grew up in India and I grew up being a Hindu. Do I get the same opportunity, the same shot at heaven that Christians get? Because according to what Brad Pitt, what he believed, what he was brought up to say, was that unless you are Christian, you are not going to this is, this, this is not computing for me. I don't get this. Because if that's the reality, then God isn't fair and I don't want nothing to do with God. Some people ask me today, do you believe in God? And I say, yes and no. Yes, I do believe in God, and no, I don't believe in God. I'll tell you in a little bit what that means. All right? He goes on to say, I didn't understand this idea of a God who says, you have to acknowledge me. You have to say that I'm the best, and then I'll give you eternal happiness. If you won't, then you don't get it. It seems to be about ego. I can't see God operating from ego, so it made no sense to me. Does Brad Pitt have any is that smart, or what do you guys think? Yeah? Searching. Searching. He's searching, right? And he's asking some good questions. And he's saying, if that's what it's about, I don't know if I believe in God then. Well, Gwyneth Paltrow. You guys know Gwyneth Paltrow? Yes. Gwyneth Paltrow says this, religion is the cause of all the problems in the world. Now, this is her perspective. This is her analysis, right? I'm not saying she's correct, but, but I'm saying these things because this is what a lot of people are saying out there. That say, I don't want to go to church. I don't want religion. The church is dying in the United States. I don't believe in God. And I'm trying to say, no, God is irresistible. But they're saying, hey, religion is the, is the cause of all problems in the world. I don't believe in organized religion at all. It's what separates people. One religion just represents fragments. It causes war. More people have died because of religious conflict than any other reason. Did you know that the Christian church slaughtered millions of people? I'm sorry, the Catholic church slaughtered millions of people. All in the name of God. Did you know that? Catholic church slaughtered, killed anybody who did. All in the name of God. And then the Muslims, did same thing. Killing people all in the name of God. So do they have a good point? Yes. Are they crazy? No. How many of you guys are going, Josh, where are you going with this? Yes. We're going to get there. <laughs> Last one. This girl is, uh, she does a series, The Orange is the New Black. Oh, yeah. uh, Taylor Shewing. Here's what she says. She says, I believe in science. I believe in evolution. I believe in Nate Silver, Neil deGrasse, Tyson, Christopher Hitchens. I cannot get behind some supreme being who weighs in on the Tony Awards while a million people get whacked with machetes. I don't believe a billion Indians are going to hell. When we're talking about people in India who are Hindu. I don't think we get cancer to learn life lessons. And I don't believe that people die young because God needs another angel. Do you see that she is thinking about this thing and what people have told her was, oh, you got cancer because there's a reason. Oh, um, you know, I'm sorry, your, your five-year-old daughter died because God needed another angel. And she's going, what? That sounds bogus. And she says, I can't get along with this. If God's uh, involved with the, uh, what is it, the Tony Awards. You ever hear people, they win an award, like, I want to thank God, and uh, God brought me here. And she's like, if God is about some awards in Hollywood while millions of people are dying, getting whacked by machetes, I don't want that. So why are you saying all this, Josh? 
I'm saying this because I want us to think differently about God. I'm saying this because I believe that the reason why people don't want a lot of times nothing to do with God is because people who claim to believe in God are some of the ugliest people inside. Ouch. Some people that claim to believe in God are some of the saddest people you will meet. How can you be so sad? Now, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with being having states of sadness, yes or no? But if you meet a person that's always sour, don't look to your right or to your left. I'm going to close my eyes. When you meet somebody who's just yeah. always in a bad mood and yet they claim to believe in God, come on, man. If you really say that you believe in God, that you've got this connection with God, you should be one of the happiest people on earth. You should be smiling. You should be contagious. We should be people who've got so much energy that people are just drawn to us and say, I want what you got, bro. Amen. Like, whatever you're on, I want it. I'm on some Jesus. That's what I'm on. I'm not on, I'm not on cocaine. I'm not on speed. I'm not on uh, ecstasy. I'm not on any of that stuff. I'm simply on Jesus. And I believe that if we started living this way, more people would say, I want what you got. That's irresistible. And some Christians are so awkward. You ever met an awkward Christian? You know what I mean? Like, because when they're when they're when they're put in a situation that in an experience, a, a moment, should I say, where where um, they feel uncomfortable because it goes against some things are going against their beliefs. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. And they're like super awkward, and they get all like, and they just make you feel weird. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. You know, like when people don't have to say anything to you, but you can feel that they don't like you. Huh? Like, have you ever gotten a hug from somebody who, when they hugged you, it was like you had leprosy? Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Like, or have you ever, I mean, <laughs> have you ever just talked to people that, man, they just made you feel like, as soon as you left their presence and conversation, you left feeling like life was not put into you, but life was literally sucked out of you. But here's what I love about God. God is such a powerful, beautiful being that whenever you hang out with God, God never takes life from us. God adds life to us. Amen. God literally pours joy into us. God pours optimism into us. God pours peace into our hearts. God pours these things that make us invincible. I cannot tell you. Let me tell you the truth. I cannot pray for a long time in my room or in my house. If I pray with my eyes closed, I'll fall asleep in about two minutes. Yes or no? Yes. So what I do is I have to go for a walk. I go to Balboa Park. I go by the water. Whatever. And I'm walking, and that's my prayer. And the whole time, I'm talking to God. Then I pause, and I, and, I, and I shut up. Sometimes we want to hear from God, but we don't shut up. We're just like telling God all about our... Da, 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 okay, God, bye. And God's like, wait, I've got something to say. But when I go for a walk, let me tell you what happens. Every time I am intentionally mindful and aware that I'm in God's presence, it literally transforms my heart and my mind. Literally. So when I'm negative, or I feel like life is terrible, or you get to those points where, uh, you ever get to those points in life where you're just like, you feel like you're never gonna make it? I guess. Right? You're just like, oh, limited self thoughts and thinking and, and I know the answer. Spend time with God. Be aware of God's presence. Be mindful. Because when we are, it changes everything. And I don't know about you, but I believe God is calling us to be irresistible church. 
That's what I believe. I believe God wants us to be irresistible. That every time we gather, it should be an irresistible moment. That every time we come to church, it should be an irresistible, uh, irresistible event. That every time we have Bible studies or dinners or go to the movies or have family gatherings, whatever we're doing, it should be an irresistible experience. And why not? Some people think, well, Josh, that's too much. Why not? Life is too dang short to be moping around and not enjoy life. Man. It is our duty to enjoy life. Yeah. It is our duty to do something with the life that God has given us. It is our duty to be creative because God is a creator. Yeah. Which means God is the most creative, being intelligent, being in the entire universe. God says, I gave you a brain. Dream a little. I gave you feelings and emotions. Love a little. I gave you a voice to sing. Go show that voice off. I gave you the gift to paint. Go do something with it. I gave you the gift to save someone's life. Go out and reach and touch people. It's too short to just stay locked up in your house. It's too short not to tell people you love them every day. It's too short to not live in an irresistible way. Amen. Would you, would you, would you please, would you commit to this week to say, God, I want to live an irresistible life. And maybe, maybe we don't know exactly what that means. That's what we're going to take for the next few weeks. What does it mean to be irresistible, have an irresistible life? But you start praying and asking, God, God, what does it mean for me? To have an irresistible life and to live irresistibly. You with me? Yes. yes. All right, I'm going to finish. I'm going to wrap this thing up because I'm taking too much of your time. Here's what Jesus said, John chapter 14. Have you ever just said, God, if you're real, show me who you are. Show me. Yeah. You ever said that? Yeah. If you really exist, if you really are God, then give me a sign. Yeah. Right? And the little hummingbird flies by. And you're like, ooh, that's God. That's a joke. Um, <laughs> my ex-wife <clears throat> said that uh, she knew she was supposed to marry me. Because she walked outside one morning and a little hummingbird flew by her. And she said, I'm supposed to marry Josh. It's kind of funny, actually. Okay. Anyways. <laughs> So if you ever want a sign, right? I want to see you, God. God, I want to see you so bad. God, would you please, would you please, would you please, God, if you're real, I don't want to know you. Watch this. John chapter 14. Philip was one of the disciples of Jesus. Of the 12, Philip was one of the disciples. And here's what he says. He says to Jesus, Jesus, Lord, show us God the Father and we will be satisfied. He didn't tell God that. If you just show me, then I'll be okay. Then I'll, then I'll really believe. Then I'll, and then I'll accept you and everything's good. Then Jesus replied, have I been with you all of this time, Philip? And yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen who? The Father. The viewer said, God, I want to see you. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But why is that important? Well, remember, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Well, where does God hang out? And who does God hang out with? Who does God like? Because if you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. If you've seen God, you've seen Jesus. Luke chapter 15. By this time, Jesus is speaking. He's out and about. By the way, just side note, most of Jesus' miracles and teachings took place outside of the synagogue. Why are you saying that, Josh? I'm just saying that you don't have to go to church to get connected or touched by God. Most of what Jesus did happened on a normal day-to-day -day basis. That didn't mean he didn't go to synagogue every Sabbath. He did. He was a good Jew who went to synagogue every Sabbath, and he did his thing. But most of his miracles, his teachings happened every day outside of synagogue. Amen? Amen. All right. So here Jesus is hanging out with all his people. By this time, a lot of what? Sinners. sinners. 
men and women of doubtful reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. Do you know anybody who has a doubtful reputation? Don't look to your left or to your right. Doubtful reputation. Hanging around who? Jesus. Jesus. And they are listening how? <laughs> Falling on every word that's coming out of their sight. The Pharisees, now watch this, and the religion scholars were not at all pleased. They grumbled. He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. What's your point, Josh? If you've seen Jesus, you've seen who? God. And who's, who's the Father attracting? Sinners. Sinners. People with doubtful reputations. Who is God repelling? Not because he wants to repel, but who is God repelling? Pharisees and the religious scholars. So if God were here today, a lot of times you say, oh, I gotta go to church. I gotta go here. You wanna know where God would probably be? Hmm? The bars. The bars. Oklahoma Boulevard. North Park, all those millennials. Dang, they're so hipsters. <laughs> all of these bad people. Right? Why? And the beautiful thing is this, that, that Jesus, now you would, would, would you say Jesus is holy? Yes. Would you say God is holy? Yes. Yeah, you see one, God is holy, yes? yes. Jesus is holy, yeah? Is God sinless? Yes. Is Jesus sinless? Yes. yes. And yet, as perfect and holy, as sinless as God is, these horrible people don't feel uncomfortable around him. They actually are attracted to him. They want to hear what he has to say. I bet you Jesus, oof, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. I bet you Jesus didn't even have to say it. I bet just the way he walked, he was exuding love. That people that were gross, they didn't feel judged. They didn't feel that bad energy. They didn't feel any of that. That when Jesus came into their presence, all of a sudden it was like a sweet fragrance. Like smelling a rose for the first time in the morning. Jesus hanging out with these people. So religious people said, I don't want nothing to do with them. I already did that part. One last one. Oh. Everyone say Hamad. Hamad. Hamad to Los. Hamad to Los. That's Greek for sinners. Because I want to know, well, the author's writing these sinners. Well, what, is sinner, what does this sinner mean in, in that? It's sinful, depraved, detestable, falling short of what, what? God approves. What is wide of the mark, you're missing the mark, a blatant sinner. A sinner is somebody that said that God, according to the, to, to the definition what the Pharisees said, God doesn't approve of these people because they're not living good lives. God doesn't approve of these types of people because they're not living good lives. And Jesus comes in and he goes, I approve of you. I love you. Yep. I love you so much that it doesn't matter what you do, how you live, where you've been. I want to be around you. But I also love you so much that I want to see you get healthier and better. I love you enough to just accept you right here, right now. But I also love you too much to allow you to stay in that mess. Do you hear it? It's not like it's not like you gotta get your act together and then you can come. Or you gotta believe. Better believe before. You gotta accept this truth. You gotta get baptized. You gotta take 14 amazing Bibles. My amazing Bible wasn't amazing facts. 14 Bible studies, and then you can get baptized. Then you can join the church. No. Jesus is like, 
I've never seen anything so beautiful in my life. Why? Because I'm in you. Woo! And you're in me. God's fingerprints are all over you, uncle. You are forever a part of God, and God is forever a part of you. So when you look at yourself in the mirror every day, not only are you looking at Daniel Rios, but you're also seeing a piece of God. Because you are an extension of God's life. I'm an extension of God's life. That means every single person that you see every day, you've got to go, wow, you're beautiful. Why? Not only because of you, but because God has touched you. Amen. God is a great master artist. And all of us have his signature imprinted on us. Amen. So even though these are sinners, God doesn't approve of you people. Jesus comes along, and just by hanging out with them shows, you guys, I, shh, I approve of them, relax. I love them. But I also love them enough to let them know, hey, let's live a better life. Because I want to see you become the best version of you. Not what other people say you need to be. Not what religion says you got to be. But you. The you that I created you to be. Marco, if you can come up, we're going to close. Luke chapter 7, once again. If you've seen me, you've seen who? The Father. The Father. And Jesus is irresistible to people, to these bad people. And here's what Jesus says. He says, for John the Baptist didn't spend his time eating bread or drinking what? Wine. Wine. Drinking what? Wine. Wine. Right? John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, by the way. And they call him John the Baptist because he actually baptized Jesus around the age of 30. All right? They were born, and they didn't see each other for about the first 30 years of their life. And the first day that John sees Jesus, even though he had physically never met Jesus before, the first glimpse that he got of him, he goes, that's the Son of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. Never met him! But there was a glow about Jesus, right? There was this, this love and this peace, this irresistibleness about Jesus. And when John said, there's the Son of God who, put, who, who takes away the sins of the whole world, the one who's going to come and heal us all. And so here Jesus is talking about his cousin, John. And he says, listen, John the Baptist, my cousin, didn't spend time eating bread or drinking wine. And you say, he's possessed by a demon. Some people are never satisfied. This dude, you couldn't find nothing. He had no dirt on his tracks. And the religious people were saying, he's possessed by a demon. Why? Because John didn't do things how they did things religiously. And usually what you and I don't understand, we, deem, we demonize people. You don't believe like me. You must have a demon. Some people said that I was, that I was possessed by a demon at, the, at, the, at our mother church. Um, he said that I, I was possessed by a demon, and then I, I did witchcraft, and all, and all this kind of craziness. Yep, 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 yep. Because I didn't package the religious package how he wanted to hear it. And I asked him one question. I never responded or retaliated with anger or hate. Nothing. I showed him love. I kid you not. It was God's my witness. I had not one ounce of retaliation. I just loved him. And one day I even sang a song in church as a special music, and I sang it to him. Looking at him, I literally say it to him as if he was the only person in the audience. And he's, I'm a demon. Yeah. So I have one question for you. I said, do you love me? I don't know, well, that's what the Bible says. It says the love. No, I don't know. I get it. I don't Do you love Joshua Aaron Rios, your brother? I'm your brother. Do you love me? Well, he couldn't say I love you. So here's him claiming to be this believer. And yet, full of hate. Huh? Full of anger. So here it is. These Pharisees are saying, ah, he's filled by a demon. So on one part, John is perfect. He's doing nothing wrong. 
and they say he has a demon. On the other part, here's Jesus. And the Son of Man, on the other hand, me, Jesus talking about. You say I feast, I go to, because Jesus was known for going to parties. And I drink, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. <coughs> what do you want? You want John who's perfect, who's got no track record, but you say he's a demon? And then there's me, I'm going out with people, and you call me a drunk and a glutton and a friend of sinners and tax collectors? <laughs> if you've seen Jesus, you've seen who? So where do I see God? At feasts, with tax collectors, with sinners, at the party. But don't get me wrong, he's never at the party to, to speak down, he's always at the party to elevate. Right? Jesus had such a powerful influence that when he came around, people saw him back like, I, I want to I wanna be better. You ever met somebody where you just meet him and you're like, yeah, I want to be better. I want to do better. Not because I feel judged, but because they're living their life in such a powerful way that I want what they have. God's heart, I wrote this, is the most beautiful and irresistible place to discover. What do you discover? God's heart is the most beautiful, irresistible place to discover. Remember we read Song of Solomon. That brother got down. <laughs> your love is better than wine. Kiss me with your mouth. You know that? I mean, he's getting all poetic. He's getting Picasso. <laughs> Picasso's an inside joke. I'll tell you about it later. When we discover and experience this place, we become irresistible people who don't argue, we don't hate, or treat others indifferently. Instead, we paint an irresistible picture of God that the world would love to know. Would you do me a favor? This week, would you say, God, help me to live an irresistible life and help me to paint an irresistible picture of you so that when others meet, so that when the Brad Pitts and the Gwyneth Paltrow's and the people of this world when they come, you can say, yeah, I agree with you. I don't, that's not the God that I serve or I know. I serve a much different God. Because the God that I know, the Jesus I know, he's hanging out with all those people that you say. All those people say, I don't believe in God based on moral grounds. How can you believe in God who does that? And you can come back and say, let me paint a picture of this God that I think we both can agree on. So when people ask me, do you believe in God? I say, yes and no. Because I don't believe in the God that you believe that. Some people say God hates everybody but Christians. That's not the God I believe in. So no, I don't believe in that God. But I do believe in the God that so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever, whoever, any color of race, education, non-education, Whoever believes in it will not perish. But I learned a lesson. I do believe in the God, Jesus says next, for God did not send his son to the world to judge the world or to condemn it, but to save it, to give it life, and to bring healing and love. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for allowing us to start off our new series, Irresistible. God, I know a lot was said today. And so all I'm praying right now is that each of us individually would take time today, tomorrow, this week, whenever, and just journal, just think about, start praying, start meditating, and ask God, God, I want to know the irresistible you. And, and as I get to know the irresistible you, I myself will become an irresistible person who's full of life and joy and hope. I pray that you help us to become an irresistible church that whoever comes through these doors will experience the irresistible God. Thank you for hearing this and answering this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Family, you are